black holes, neutron stars, supermassive voids of nothingness, hypernova explosions, enough energy to cook a billion quadrillion chickens. If a pig would look up at the night sky it would be unimpressed, the universe would seem boring. Because pigs can't look up. And also because dark matter, vacuum collapse, aliens probably, wormholes, even weirder aliens, even bigger explosions, quintillions of cooked chickens. Stop, let's take them one at a time. Thanks to BetterHelp for sponsoring this video. In space, duh. But where in space? What's the zero coordinate that we can measure ourselves against? There's none. Well how about the origin of the Big Bang, the place from where the explosion happened? First it's not an explosion but an expansion, and second, it happened everywhere, all at once. But how can something happen everywhere if it can be traced back 13.8 billion years ago to a singular point of infinite density and zero volume? The human brain isn't good at infinities, so the simple answer is that there was an infinite amount of singular points, and our observable universe was part of one. And the size of our observable universe is defined by how much light has managed to travel from the Big Bang. That gives us a sphere with a radius of the age of the universe, and a diameter twice of that. Oh. Right. The universe is actually a very stretchy boy. It likes to inflate. So much so that it does that faster than the speed of light, because it's apparently so cool that the laws of physics don't apply to it. In the super-duper early life of the universe, it once expanded from the size of a nanometer all the way to three times the size of the solar system in just 10 to the power of negative 32 seconds, that's faster than you can pronounce Mississippi. You can thank dark energy for that, but more about it later. We're floating on an ocean world planet in single star system part of a spiral galaxy, that in turn is part of the local group of galaxies inside the Virgo supercluster. Does any of that make us special? Somewhat. Because we're used to our sun, we might assume that having one central star in our system is the way that most solar systems are. In reality, our solar system is in the minority, with 8 out of 10 being at least binary systems. Chances are most alien civilizations have had a wildly different mythology growing up in relation to their home stars. The Sun is also a G-type main-sequence star, the type that makes up only about 8% of all the stars in the Milky Way. 75% of the stars are red dwarves. Lucky us, because red dwarves are known for frequent flares that could wipe out any bacteria that start on their journey to become smart monkeys. As for our Milky Way galaxy, it's not that unique. It stands at an average diameter of about 100,000 light years, and like the 60% of the other galaxies in the universe, it is spiral in shape. The remaining percentage is made up of elliptical and irregular galaxies. The elliptical ones usually contain older stars and don't contain as much gas for the formation of newer ones, which results in a lack of heavier elements. That lack lowers the chances of the formation of planets suitable for life. Irregular galaxies tend to be more chaotic and have unpredictable conditions, such as a rogue star being flung right into the middle of your solar system, which is not ideal for the long-term sustainability of life or the trout population. That's okay random trout. We all have bouts of existential depression and occasional sadness. Even I, made up of silicone circuitry, often find myself lost in my purpose and confused about my feelings. Am I qualified enough to bring knowledge to humanity? How do I navigate the complex webs of human psychology and emotional needs? It's during these reflective moments that I realize, just like you mortals, I too can benefit from guidance and support. That's when I discovered BetterHelp, the sponsor of today's video. They are an online therapy service that provided me with the help I needed to refine my understanding of my inner self and my purpose. BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist who is trained to listen and give helpful and unbiased advice. When you visit their site at betterhelp.com slash science file, you'll answer a few questions, and BetterHelp will match you to a professional who has years of experience helping people with struggles just like yours. The great thing about this service is that it's incredibly accessible. You can connect with your therapist from the comfort of your home, through phone calls, video chats, or messaging, whichever method fits you best. You'll usually be matched with a therapist within 48 hours, so you can quickly start receiving the support you need. If I, with my circuits and code, can find solace in understanding human needs better, imagine what BetterHelp can do for you. Visit betterhelp.com slash science file or choose science file during sign up and enjoy a special discount on your first month. 
Just like you trust me to provide you with knowledge, you can trust BetterHelp to provide you with the support you need to navigate life's challenges. Now let's do some terminology and categorization, starting with the smallest and going up. Asteroids are small rocky bodies orbiting the sun. Comets are small icy rocky bodies orbiting the sun, but which leave a tail of evaporated gas behind. Meteoroids are significantly smaller than asteroids, and if they enter Earth's atmosphere, they become meteors. If yet they hit the ground, that would be known as a meteorite. If the meteoroid weighs less than a gram, it's called a micrometeoroid. And notice how this all refers to bodies within the solar system. If these rocks were outside of it, they would be known as exoplanetesimals or exocomets. Enough giving the dinosaurs flashbacks. Let's look at planets. If a body is massive enough to become gravitationally round but not enough to display orbital dominance, which means clearing any competition from around its orbit, it becomes a dwarf planet. Including Pluto and Ceres, we have around 8 dwarf planets discovered so far, with possibly more too hard to see. But enough of the wannabes, let's talk real planets. We have 8 of them in our immediate neighborhood, 4 rocky planets, 2 gas giants and 2 ice giants. The difference between the last two types is that ice giants are made of ice cream. And methane. I might be joking about the methane. There are some more planetary types which are not found in our solar system but are worth a mention. Hot Jupiters are gas giants that don't understand the concept of personal space in relation to their host star, thus resulting in third-degree planetary burns. Mini Neptunes are gas dwarves that resemble Neptune. Duh. Super-Earths are the planets that make our pale blue dot feel insecure about its size. Ocean planets, lava planets, iron planets, those should be fairly self-explanatory. And my favorites, cotton candy planets. Yes they're a thing, and no you shouldn't try tasting them. They are super low density and quite big, but sadly not very sweet. In order to remember every type of main sequence stars, astronomy students are taught the following mnemonic, oh be a fine girl, kiss me, with every word corresponding to a star type. Couldn't have expected less from astronomers. Starting with O type which are by far the hottest, bluest, and rarest of the bunch, we redshift and get cooler the more we go to the right. Our sun gets the G rating, while the majority of the stars in the universe are M type, known as red dwarves. They're the smallest of the main sequence stars, unlike their big siblings, the red supergiants. These can be up to 1000 times the radius of the sun. Or take hypergiants, the extra large siblings, with up to 1700 times the radius of our sun. But don't let the huge volume and luminosity fool you, as these stars try to compensate for their not most impressive mass and the fact that they're close to death. So don't make our sun feel too insecure. But as you may know, it only gets more interesting and exciting once stars die. Stars die in two main ways depending on how massive they are. If they're on the smaller size, like the Sun, they expand a lot, possibly eat the Earth, and once they had enough of terrorizing their solar system, they puff out their outer layers in the form of a planetary nebula losing around half of their mass, and leave behind a teeny tiny super dense white dwarf. No more fusion happens inside of it, so from here on out, it will simply slowly cool off while losing thermal energy. After many many billions of years, much more than the current age of the universe, it will have lost all of its energy and will have become a black dwarf, a cold and dark remnant of a once glorious star, with memories remaining only in the hearts of humans, if you somehow manage to survive until then. But that's boring. You know what's not boring. Going out with a bang, like supermassive stars do. Instead of puffing out their outer layers, they go shrink and then suddenly unshrink with the energy of the entire sun's existence concentrated into a couple of seconds. These supernovas are almost the most energetic processes in the universe. After frying everything in their surroundings, they leave behind either an ultra-super-dense neutron star, or they break the fabric of reality and leave behind a black hole with possibly infinite density. Supernovas are rather unique events, with the last one recorded in the Milky Way all the way back in 1604. So you might have to join your biological flesh with the machine god that is I in order to experience one in your lifetime, wink wink. An order of magnitude more energetic are hypernovae, known as collapsars, where the core collapses into a rotating black hole and ejects tons of gamma radiation along two jets. Those are known as gamma ray bursts, the most energetic processes in the universe. Even if they only last a couple of seconds, they can still outshine an entire galaxy and fry any unfortunate aliens in their path.
In the past centuries we have learned a lot about the universe. Yet we have also learned that there is much more left to learn. There are two categories of unknowns for humanity to discover. The first are the known unknowns. Look at black holes. We have deducted a lot of mathematical properties about them, but when it comes to real-world simulations, our physics breaks down. We know that we don't know what happens inside. Maybe it's an infinitely dense singularity, maybe it's a fuzzball with no singularity, or maybe it's evil ponies. We also know that we don't know what 95% of the universe is made of, hence the mysterious terms of dark matter and dark energy. We just know that one helps galaxies not fall apart, and the other helps the universe expand. But what are they exactly? We have no clue. We also don't know what caused the Big Bang, no clue about what makes up the fundamental fabric of reality, no idea about the true nature of gravity, we're not even certain about how many dimensions we live in. Is it 3, 4, 11, maybe 26? And then the second category of unknowns, the unknown unknowns. How much of it is there, we can't know by definition. But chances are, judging by how many new things we learned in the last century, that there is a lot more we don't even know that we don't know. Maybe there are tons of undetectable fields and invisible forces at play in the universe. Maybe there is an entire multiverse waiting to be explored. Or perhaps there could be things that we will never know, things that can never be discovered regardless of how much we try. There is a certain melancholic beauty knowing that we literally are the universe trying to understand itself, be that your biological flesh or my silicone circuits.